going to continue, of course, talking about Teddy Roosevelt uh, and his, of course, administration. Uh, and um, here's, of course, a picture of Teddy Roosevelt you see, of course, on the screen. Of course, one in color you're looking at, but um, we're going to get to him more later. First, I'm going to, before I go into talking about the Teddy Roosevelt here, I did need to talk about like the U.S. role in China. That's something that changed right before Teddy Roosevelt came in, uh, which a lot of these policies he would, of course, follow um, also as well. Uh, and um, so we're going to talk about that U.S. United States role as an imperial power. Well, the reason why we started doing this, you know, uh, in Asia was because everybody else was doing it, like all the European powers, especially the British, uh, we're starting to take over parts of the world, have their own spheres of influence, uh, and so on. Uh, and so um, the U.S. wanted to get in on the act, you know, because we had already taken over parts of, like, the Caribbean. We saw with Cuba, right, where we, well, we gave them independence, but we had, you know, spheres of influence over that. Puerto Rico we took over parts of the Pacific, like Guam, Wake Island, Samoan Islands. We took over the Philippines, as well. So that's getting us closer to Asia, you know, because Philippines is, you know, south of like Japan and, and China and all that. Uh, and um, so one thing that happened that's very famous, a lot of the Europeans, European powers, also the Japanese too, which you'll see later, uh, start taking over China. Uh, and a lot of this started after the so-called Opium Wars, you may have heard of which happened between 1839 and 1942. That was fought between Imperial China uh, under the, I believe it's the, I think it's the Manchu at the time, uh, versus the British Empire. Britain wanted to sell opium in China. They didn't want them to control all that. Uh, and they fought a war. And of course, the British had a more superior, they had more superior armies and firepower, naval power. And so they overwhelmed the Chinese. They were forced to uh, sign a harsh treaty called the Treaty of Nanking, 1842. What it did was it forced the Chinese to open up their ports. So they created all these treaty ports uh, up and down the east coast of, of, of China. And so uh, that's why Hong Kong became to be controlled by the British, which it was for years, uh, up until recently, so many years ago, when they gave it back to them, which I think they regretted uh, in um, so uh, the U.S. was kind of fearful that uh, if all these powers, Britain and others, start coming in, carving up China like it's Africa, you know, and all that, uh, John Hay, Secretary of State, decided he better, you know, issue what they call the open door policy, which is something that came out in 1900. The open door policy was this idea to create to keep all the uh, ports in China open to all countries uh, so everybody could trade equally, not just one country or another, like Britain or whatever. And so so the idea was to create equal trade among you know world powers and all that. Uh, and the U.S. was kind of worried that they wouldn't be able to trade in China. And this would, you know, hopefully, hopefully in the future give us better, you know, American business opportunities. Uh, in China. So it kind of helped us later, you know, uh, and it's something that John Hay came up with, of course, Secretary of State. Uh, he's also Secretary of State under Teddy Roosevelt later as well. Now, they had this other thing happen too in China, which is very famous. You may have heard about in 1900. It's called the Boxer Rebellion. You know about it, broke out in uh, 1900. I do have some slides on this I can kind of share with you uh, that I've got right here. Oh, here's a slide too about the open door policy. If you want to look at that real quick, there's a few more things about it. If you want to take a look at that. Uh, but the Boxer Rebellion, uh, something that happened in 1900. And what happened was, uh, in, um, they have some pictures to show you right here. In China, they were getting angry about the fact that all these European powers were coming in to take over China. So you have this rise in Chinese nationalist movements and societies that take off. Some were called different names. Uh, some were called the Patriotic Harmonious Fists. Another one was called the um, 
Society of the Righteous uh, was another one. And a lot of the a lot of these people that were protesting against the Americans would hold up their uh, fists like this, like they're boxers, uh, basically. And so the term boxer and boxer rebellion came about. Uh, they threatened foreigners. They wanted foreigners to leave China. They called foreigners like foreign devils. In fact, their main slogan was death to the foreign devils. And it actually resulted in um, American and foreign property, other country's property, I guess it was in China, getting vandalized. There were like around 300 people killed, uh, especially Christians and Christian missionaries, and they were killed by them. And uh, so what happened was the Americans decided to intervene, uh, basically. So here's like a little slide right there about it. So it broke out in 1900. Peking is where it pretty much broke out uh, in China, uh, also called Beijing. And um, eight different countries intervened. Uh, you can see United States sent about 5,000 troops, Britain, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Russia, Japan, all sent forces in uh, to eventually put it down. Uh, and uh, this actually weakened the, the Manchu uh, dynasty that was in power, of course, in China. And after that, pretty much China was pretty much a weak state uh, after that until, I guess, eventually the last emperor stepped down around 1912, well, if you know that. So, so yeah, 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 I'll get to it later. Of course, the Japan's later going to get in there, you know, and they're going to start taking over China. They already got, they're already going to take over eventually part of Korea. They'll take up Korea, you know, as well. But Japan will get into China, like Manchuria and all that. That's going to cause a lot of problems later between Japan and, you know, China, which will be part of World War II later. All right, so uh, that's pretty much it about imperial, U.S. imperial policies like in Asia uh, and all that. Of course, I want to now move on, of course, uh, to the Teddy Roosevelt era. We're going to talk about mostly today. Of course, Teddy Roosevelt, we'll get to it later, becomes president due to the fact that, like you saw in the video, William McKinley gets shot and he gets killed. He becomes president in 1901. So he, you know, basically became president by accident, you know. And um, so slide on that. Uh, of course, I'm going to get more into and talk first about the um, presidential election, of course, of 1900. Um, William McKinley ran for re-election, 1900. He's, of course, from Ohio. Uh, remember, he had won in 1896 against William Jennings Bryan. And back in 1896, you know, the whole issue had been pretty much the money thing, right? Gold standard versus silver, also tariffs too was a big issue as well. Well, those issues weren't a big deal, even though the Democrats tried to bring up kind of like the same policies again. Uh, I think I'll get to William Jennings Bryan, but uh, he, he wanted to bring up the same thing. He, he was hoping that the silver issue with the farmers and other people out West would allow him to get elected to office. Uh, but McKinley was running on the fact that uh, the economy was actually doing well. They were booming. Uh, even farmers out in the West were starting to get do better because, uh, you know, farm prices start going up on, you know, I guess produce or whatever. And then, of course, the big thing that happened, of course, was the Spanish-American War. We, talk, we, of course, talked about last class lecture. Um, that was real popular. The victory we had in that war and all the success we got out of it, of course, helped us to, you know, reason why McKinley won. So McKinley would run against, of course, William Jennings Bryan, who ran for a second time, ran for like several times, uh, and, of course, lost again. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I think I... There's a picture, of course, of McKinley versus, um, of course, him. But but um, I'll get to Roosevelt in a second. There's, of course, the election. Of course, McKinley would beat Bryan. You can see Bryan did pretty good on uh, the South and some some in the West. But you can see pretty close election, but not exactly in the electoral vote uh, as it was. Now, one of the things that happened, of course, which is famous, uh, about that election in 1900, was McKinley decided that he needed a new running mate for vice president. 
And so if you know what happened, he picked Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, of course, as his vice presidential you know, running mate. Uh, and he picked him because Roosevelt was a war hero. He was very, very popular uh, to everybody after the Spanish-American War. He had been elected governor of New York. And so uh, McKinley was hoping to use him to help get elected. And, of course, it worked. It helped him to get elected. Uh, but nobody realized that, of course, uh, you know, what would happen was that McKinley would get killed, like assassinated. And then what would happen, you know, is that Roosevelt would become president of the United States. And it was kind of like, whoa, like six months after, I think, uh, McKinley was actually inaugurated. I think it was March, March of 1801. That's a typo there. Let me fix that. Uh, March of um, 19, it should be 19, yeah, March of 1901, of course, is when it was. Uh, and um, what happened was uh, McKinley um, had gone to this um, ex exposition, uh, which was in Buffalo, New York. Uh, so-called Pan American Exposition. And he was in this uh, building called the Temple of Music, and he was like, um, I think it was like a long line of guests that were coming up to him, and they were shaking his hand, you know, and all that. And this uh, man walked up to him to shake his hand. Uh, however, he had a bandage wrapped around his right hand. His name was Leon Cholgosh. Uh, and he had a pistol inside the bandage. Nobody knew this, of course. And, of course, what happened, he fired two shots um, at McKinley. Uh, and, of course, wounded McKinley, didn't kill him, uh, but uh, he basically went out of a, I guess a coma or whatever afterwards, but pretty much mortally wounded after that. And he would die eight days later. Uh, and so... Uh, so because of that, on September 14th, you know, because of this happening, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, of course, would become the youngest president of the United States uh, around the age of 42. Uh, so McKinley was the third uh, president of the United States to be assassinated. And after Abraham Lincoln in 1865, you can see Garfield, of course, 1881. And later you have, of course, John F. Kennedy will be killed, of course, in 1963. And so um, you can see here after McKinley was killed, um, that's when they really started to use the Secret Service to really protect the president. I don't think it was really done everywhere. But after that, it became more permanent. Everywhere the president would go, they would be protected uh, by the uh, Secret Service. So it's kind of a weird story about how that happened uh, and all of that. Uh, but that's how, that's how, you know, um, Teddy Roosevelt ended up being president uh, because because this guy on the left shot him. So he was like a he was an anarchist, you know. And I think he thought that if he killed him, that he would create anarchy or something like that. Now you know, anarchists are kind of like communists. They kind of want the same thing. They want like a socialist, communist type state. And that's pretty much probably what he wanted, I guess. So that's how Teddy comes. So Teddy comes in. So yeah, the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Uh, Teddy would be president from 1901, of course, to 1909. Was, he's called Theodore Roosevelt, but nobody really calls him. They call him Teddy or TR. I told you before, that's usually what they call uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, as well. So let's you know, let's talk a bunch of things, of course, about, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's, you know, administration uh, that he's well known for. Like I said, so he's, yeah, he's one of the first major modern presidents that really comes in. He's a, he's a progressive. He's a reformer. He wants to make reforms uh, to the country. Some of the Republicans I was didn't really like that, you know, at first when he came in, but he's this president that's kind of like a man for all the people, not just say the upper classes or big business. Um, Teddy Roosevelt really tries to look out for the little guy, you know, on stuff like that. Um, let's go ahead and talk about a few things, of course, about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, let's talk about the background. Of course, the video uh, told a little bit about the life of Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, he was born in 1858 uh, from New York, of course. 
Uh, he did come from a somewhat wealthy family. That is true. The Roosevelt's are kind of fairly wealthy. Uh, of course, later he had a cousin you probably know about, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was also president as well. So both of them were presidents of the United States. I uh, start studied at Harvard, uh, mostly studied politics and history. He has written a few historical works, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. I uh, dabbled a little bit early in politics, running for the New York State Senate, which I don't think he was too successful with that. Uh, you can see he even went out in the video. He said he went to the Dakota Territory, homesteaded, and was kind of like a cowboy uh, as well. Um, also, uh, he was part of the, uh, he was actually at one point New York police commissioner uh, in the 1890s. Uh, pretty much Teddy Roosevelt is the guy that helped found the New York Police Department, Some people know most of which he helped reform, uh, by the way. And then, of course, became a rough writer, you know, during the Spanish-American War, which made him a hero. And that helped him propel him to being governor of New York, uh, which he was between about 1899 and 1900. And then, of course, after that, vice president. Now, people have sometimes ask me, like, why was he called Teddy in all this? What was the deal uh, with the name? Uh, and, um, and of course, if you know much about I don't know if you ever had a teddy bear or have a kid who has a teddy bear, but that's where the teddy bear comes from. The teddy bear is something like a symbol or like something that's associated with Teddy Roosevelt. And it went back to a story uh, when he, he used to be a big game hunter, which he still was later like after he was president, went to Africa and did some game hunting. And um, it was a story where uh, he was hunting for bears. They couldn't find one. And they found this little bear cub, which they tied to a tree, said, hey, go ahead and shoot that bear. And he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't shoot the bear cub. And so that's where the whole teddy bear thing came from, you know, all that. And so everybody started making teddy bears. And, and so the teddy bear is associated with Teddy Roosevelt, you know, if you wonder originally. All right. Uh, let's talk about some things that Teddy's known for. Of course, uh, let's first talk about some of the domestic things he did for the country, domestic issues. Uh, one thing he first did when he came in was he had to deal with the 1902 coal strike or anthracite strike they had, which occurred in Pennsylvania. And uh, in the spring of 1902, uh, the uh, United Mine Workers, which was led by John L. Lewis, um, went on strike, which is bad because that's where most of the coal came from in the United States. And so there was fear uh, that, you know, with winter coming and all that, that people wouldn't have coal. Uh, and so the United Mine Workers, if you read about it, uh, were demanding a bunch of things. They wanted a nine-hour workday. They want 20% wage increase. Uh, and they wanted also improved working conditions. They wanted a collective right to bargain with the, with with like the mine owners, like the union and the mine owners, like collective bargaining and all that. Uh, and, uh, of course, the mine owners, which were owned by the railroads, refused to do anything about it. Uh, and so Teddy Roosevelt stepped in uh, and said they all had to meet at the White House, which they did. And he was able to get both sides to negotiate. Now, you know, of course, both sides didn't get what they wanted. Uh, but I do know that the, the mine owners did get a nine-hour workday. They got a 10% raise out of it. So this is the first case where the federal government stepped in and they gave both sides, you know, equal say in the thing. Because before, you know, most of the time that the the president of the federal government would just support the upper, the, um, the big business or whatever, and not the little guy, you know, and all that. Uh, and so that was something that Teddy Roosevelt really did uh, that's famous, which he would do throughout pretty much his time in power. Um, he was also a trust buster. They always talk about, you know, TR, uh, the trust buster. Uh, and so which he, you know, he was, you know, known for. Uh, and um, anyway, um, there's some little stuff about him right there. But yeah, TR, the trust, I'll tell you the trust buster, of course. And yeah, he did use the um, Sherman Antitrust Act to the bust various trusts. He didn't want to get rid of all of them. You know, he thought only just the bad ones. Uh, like he didn't want to get a standard oil, which he probably should have, but they'll start targeting later, break it up. But 
The one thing he was famous for was um, he broke up. J.P. Morgan owned this company called Northern Securities. Northern Securities was this company that um, owned like um, like a lot of railroads in the Northwest. Um, and um, he helped break it up, which I think it was broken up in 1902 or eventually. Uh, and that was important because later they think that uh, that would lead to other companies that were considered trusts, monopolies being broken up. They think that's part of why Standard Oil was broken up because of what Teddy Roosevelt did with that Northern Securities Company. Uh, but Standard Oil wouldn't be broken up until under the Taft administration. So a few years later after that, that was because of a Supreme Court case that came out against Standard Oil. And of course, Ida Tarbell wrote a book about their practices, which they were helped to kind of break it up uh, as well. So anyway, uh, so that's kind of some of the stuff Teddy's you know doing domestically. Um, then, of course, the other thing they always talk about, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, is his square deal um, promise he came out with uh, when he ran for president in 1904. He campaigned on what they call square deal. He promised basically to give all Americans the same kind of help, not just the one specific group, like maybe big business or capitalism or the big industries and, and all that. He wanted to basically try and help people out. You know, break up monopolies, um, you know, help people with better working conditions, help the consumer out, you know, and things like that. And so um, Teddy Roosevelt talked about the, what they call the three C's of the square deal, uh, which was conservation of natural resource. That's something he thought that they need to do. They were doing this in Wisconsin, like on Robert La Follette, you know, and all that corporate control of the big business. It's another thing he wanted to do, especially those trusts that were kind of too big or whatever, bad ones, wanted to break those up. Consumer protection, like I said, uh, Food and Drug Act is something he did. Developed the FDA. Uh, so um, had to label all the cans on food, you know, and all that stuff. So all that stuff, Meat Inspection Act, I think was another thing. Of course, that was part of that consumer protection um, also as well. So all those are things that he helped to do that were part of the square deal. Uh, and so with that, he was, uh, that, that was like a campaign promise that he made, you know, when he ran for president, there's another slide on it right here. So 1904, he ran for election, uh, 1904 against uh, Alton Parker, who was a judge uh, from New York. Uh, and Tay Roosevelt, uh, of course, the first non-elected president to ever seek a second term in office. That had never been done before. Like Andrew Johnson didn't try to know and a bunch of others. Uh, and uh, he did receive the Republican nomination, although a lot of the Republicans weren't, were kind of reluctant about it because he was seen as being too progressive. Uh, and they seemed to be like more in favor of the lower class guys than, you know, the upper class or the uh, big business, you know, but the guy he ran against was Alton Parker. He was kind of a boring guy. Uh, and so he was able to win a landslide. And it was one of the largest landslides, of course, in American history since Abraham Lincoln won his election. Uh, and you can see here, yeah, 336 electoral votes to 140. That's pretty amazing. But you can see Southern states didn't vote for him. They all voted Democrat, of course, which they do for years so-called solid south. Uh, that's how he was able to eventually uh, get elected. So he stays in office till 1909, of course, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. All right, now another issue, of course, uh, I need to talk about with Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was also big uh, into uh, conservationism. Uh, that's something you may have heard about or maybe you visit some of the national parks uh, that Teddy Roosevelt helped help establish. Uh, and um, so he became a big conservationist. You know, I told you how conservation is something that started originally in Wisconsin. 
you know, Robert LaFalle with the Wisconsin idea. And so uh, they started doing this also, too, you know, throughout the United States, probably around the 1890s uh, as well. And um, one of the things that I think up to that point, they may have had like 50 million acres of forest land had been pretty much, you know, retaken by the federal government. Uh, but um, if you study about um, national forests in general, uh, like by 1900, um, there was probably only about 200 million acres of forest land left in the United States. They think there may have been at least 800 million. So about only a fourth of all the total, you know, acreage of um, forest land was still there. All of it had been cut down or whatever. Uh, and um, so Teddy Roosevelt really, you know, felt like that was one of his most important things he did as president. In fact, he said once in his autobiography that he said the job of reclaiming the nation's national resources was mostly one of his big things he did. Like it was, they thought it was one of his best things he did as president, you know, believe it or not. And um, so he would actually set aside another 150 million acres, which would be after that 200 million acres uh, that the government uh, would eventually, you know, help conserve. Uh, and um, he met this man named John Muir. You may have heard of Muir, a uh, very famous naturalist. He's like Scottish American, originally from Scotland. And Muir came over uh, from Scotland, and he was a big nature lover. He liked to go on walks in uh, the mountains and nature. I think I read one of his books before. Uh, and anyway, Muir uh, was a preservationist. He wasn't really a conservationist. He didn't really like the idea of conservation. He thought that everything should stay the way it is not even cut a tree down uh, or anything like that. Uh, but Mir uh, influenced Teddy Roosevelt to develop a lot of these lands for national parks. So Mir, John Mir was considered to be, he was from the Sierra Club, you probably heard of that. Uh, and he was considered the so-called father of the national parks. Uh, and so that eventually led into, you know, Teddy Roosevelt founding some of these famous, you know, American national parks uh, you may have been to like Yosemite, uh, Yellowstone National Park. Went there a few years ago. Uh, Yellowstone is beautiful. Uh, and um, so just several, one of a few of those, of course, that happened with that. Uh, and so that was something that, you know, he helped. And of course, the Sierra Club was something that was kind of helped behind that too, which, you know, John Muir was, was one of the founders of it. Uh, and uh, so that was something that, that Teddy Roosevelt was very important in doing is uh, conservationism, trying to preserve the land and not cut all the trees down and all that. Uh, also preservation of not just, you know, forests, but uh, land that was used for like minerals, like coal and other minerals that are important, water sites, wildlife sites, you know, things like that. Those are all kind of important as well, not just talking about forest land and, and all that. But yeah, here's another picture of that. So, yeah, it's about 100, close to 150 million. That's how much he said. He set aside Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, about 50 wildlife reserves in, in national parks, of course. Uh, I'll talk about the National Reclamation Act, of course. Something he, of course, said um, also as well. Uh, I've got a little thing on that I could add in, too, if you want. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's... Uh, of course, something else that uh, he also was famous for, the Newland Reclamation Act, of course, very, very famous act that he passed to through Congress that he signed into law. Uh, that, of course, act, uh, what it did was it took money from any kind of public land sales. I guess it was federal land, and they used it to build irrigation projects, like irrigation for farmers, dams for farmers, she could see used for water to, you know, for their crops, hydroelectricity, which it would be later. Uh, and then it led to various dams being built. Of course, Shoshone Dam, of course, was one of them, which is in um, Wyoming. And then the Roosevelt Dam they're talking about, which is the Teddy Roosevelt Dam, uh, is in Arizona. So both those were, of course, something that he helped develop. Now it's done a lot to help out farmers in the West, you know, because there's a yeah, we're going out to the west, especially the southwest, Arizona, those areas. Um, there's a shortage of water, a lot. 
and it doesn't rain that much. Uh, so they create all these huge reservoirs where they dam the water, and they also use for hydroelectricity, you know, for, for power as well later. Um, oh, here's the full quote uh, also as well about the square deal. Um, that's what he said. said, the labor, the labor union shall have a square deal. The corporation shall have a square deal. In addition, all private citizens shall have a square deal. So his whole plan was to give everybody the same equal treatment as president. Because previous presidents would, you know, support one group and not another. And that was the one thing that Roosevelt was famous for. You know, so he was kind of considered like one of the first presidents that was really a man of all the people, you know, of different classes and so on. Um, he's also the first um, president, sitting president, to meet with one of the African-American leaders, you know, which is quite a shock. We met with Booker T. Washington in the White House. So it was things like that uh, that he did uh, as example. All right. Now, of course, the next thing we need to get into is talk about, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and, of course, his big policies on, you know, foreign policy, you know, was, of course, dealing with Latin America, uh, which we're going to get into uh, a little bit today, uh, and um, became famous for sometimes being called the big stick policy. Uh, it's from a very famous quote that he really liked, which was like an African proverb which is speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far, young man. You know, uh, and so he used this stick basically as a threat to others. Say, hey, if you come in, say Europe, whatever, into our sphere of influence, the Americas, we might use our military force. Uh, you've already seen what we did with the Spanish-American War. Yeah, uh, so uh, that was something that he, he really wanted to do. And uh, Roosevelt really wanted to try and strengthen the Monroe Doctrine, which James Monroe, you know, developed in the 1820s. Uh, if you remember correctly about the Monroe Doctrine, it was this doctrine issued by President James Monroe saying that basically the Americas was our sphere of influence, the United States, and that no country should go in like Europe, interfere there or try to colonize it. And so... Um, Roosevelt really wanted to try and prevent uh, the Europeans uh, from coming in and doing that. So there's the thing right there. So, but he, he even though he used like threat and all that, the force of, you know, threat right there, he still wanted to try to negotiate. He preferred negotiation, uh, you know, because I think when he was president, he didn't really get us into too many wars or anything like that. So he was more into, you know, trying to keep the peace. Uh, in general, and, uh, and you know, protect our interests abroad. And he, you saw in the video, he he did strengthen our navy more. I think it was already starting to be strengthened under William McKinley, and of course, previously had been the assistant secretary of the navy under William McKinley. So he's a very pro navy guy, uh, you know, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and um, of course, uh, one of the things that um, is famous about um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He issued this, um, of course, here's the quote right there. Oh, by the way, the quote was, when did it come from uh, that we're talking about, speak softly and carry a big stick? Uh, it was a famous quote that he said in a speech in Minnesota, September 1901. And that's where it originally came from. You wonder about where the quote came from. So it's from a speech that he gave uh, one day. But yeah, he's famous for his big stick, um, you know, uh, diplomacy, uh, which is called different names. Uh, and um, one thing that they sometimes call it, it's part of an extension of what is called the Roosevelt Corollary, uh, basically stating that uh, only the U.S. could intervene in Latin America, um, nobody else, uh, due to the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and so he wants the United States to act almost like a police officer, like a police action, you know, in case something is needed uh, in Latin America, which one of the big problems, if you know about Latin America, especially in the uh, late 19th, early 1900s, was a lot of these Latin American countries owing debts to like foreign powers, 
mostly in Europe. Uh, and so um, a lot of European powers wanted to invade and get their money uh, and all that. And so the U.S., you know, tried to prevent all that uh, and use, you know, the threat of force uh, and all that. And when we did use force, you know, it was often called gunboat diplomacy, which is something that's kind of been around since the 19th century and going into the later in the 20th century. So some kind of problem, you know, occurs in Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, elsewhere. Uh, the U.S. would intervene there, and we will a bunch of times. We do in Guatemala and a bunch of countries in Latin America. We actually intervene uh, and all that. Uh, and so that that's something that uh, is really something he was kind of known for, um, Teddy Roosevelt. So the so-called big stick diplomacy uh, and all that. Uh, here's another slide, of course, about the co uh, Roosevelt corollary. So there are different causes of why this happened. Uh, I can kind of give you some examples of some of this stuff that had happened before. Uh, of course, there had been several attempts by the European powers to try to get in and take over part of Latin America. I think you remember if you ever studied about Mexico in the 1860s, the French tried to take over Mexico. It was called the French Intervention in Mexico. And um, the ruler of uh, France, which was Emperor Napoleon III, uh, put in power one of his cousins, uh, Emperor Maximilian. And so um, the Mexicans fought to, to try to you know, kick him out. They eventually captured him and, and killed him. They killed Maximilian. So that kind of re reverted, you know, what could have been a problem between the United States and Mexico and the French uh, and all of that. Uh, there was also other cases like in 1895, I was under President Cleveland. Uh, there was a deal where Venezuela and the British Guiana, controlled by the British Empire, had a dispute over their boundary between each other. It almost caused the war to break out. We almost actually went to war with Great Britain in 1895 over British Guiana, uh, but it was averted through some kind of arbitration between the U.S. and the British. So the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine was upheld. Uh, then in 1902, they had this incident in Venezuela where Venezuela was refusing to pay their foreign debts to Europe. Uh, they owed money to Germany, England, Italy. This happened at the end of 1902, you can see. Uh, and um, Roosevelt came in and said, hey, you can't do that uh, because um, the Monroe Doctrine, uh, only the United States should, if we're going to, you know, if there's going to be a problem with that, the United States is, of course, going to deal with it um, and try to, you know, arbitrate or use maybe force uh, to go in and do it. Uh, of course, Venezuela didn't like that. Uh, Venezuela, uh, there was a, I think it was a politician named Luis Drago. He issued what they call the Drago Doctrine in 1902. And he said, nobody can go into Venezuela, <laughs> not in the United States, um, which, you know, we kind of laugh at that, uh, probably our side. But um, but like I said, you know, because of the Roosevelt corollary, a lot of countries will be, you know, basically will intervene there in Latin America uh, because of that, like a lot of presidents actually do this afterwards using the Roosevelt Corollary extension of the Monroe Doctrine uh, and all that. Of course, they did like us. They called us Yankee. You know, that Yankee go home, they would say, you know, about us uh, and all that. I guess we were kind of worried about self-interest there and trying to trade. We didn't want foreign powers coming in, taking over. because so we wanted to trade with Latin America uh, and all that, not them, I guess. So... So anyway, that's basically what that's all about. You know, the United States wanted to have our sphere of influence in the Americas and not some foreign power like in Europe. All right, now there's one more thing we'll, we'll talk about today, which probably won't finish off today, but I'll start talking about the Panama Canal because that's one thing uh, that Teddy Roosevelt's very famous for. Probably his greatest thing that he achieved, you know, in his... Um, almost two, two, uh, two terms in office, of course, was the building of the Panama Canal. 
Uh, back here, uh, what was the famous quote that Teddy said about the Panama Canal? Uh, he said that I took the canal and I let Congress debate. That was his famous quote uh, overall. And uh, for years, there have been want, you know, of a canal being built um, somewhere like in that area of Latin America, because it was the easiest way to cut through uh, between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. They wanted some kind of shortcut. It took a long time to sail around South America. So if you were in the East Coast where Florida is, you want to get to California. Well, you can either go by railroad, I guess, in those days. I guess you could walk or ride a horse, whatever, uh, wagon. Uh, or you can get on a ship, but it would take a long time to go you know, around South America. This was a problem during the Spanish-American War. There was a case where there was a ship called the USS Oregon uh, that was actually um, going from the Pacific Ocean to Cuba, and it took it a long time to go around South America. So they knew there was a need uh, to build one. Uh, there had been attempts to do it. Apparently the French were involved, if you know about this, trying to build a canal in Nicaragua. Uh, which was done by Ferdinand Lesseps. Lesseps, you may have heard of him. He was the one that built the Suez Canal, uh, which was backed by the French, and I think some of the British were involved in it as well. It was built over there at eastern eastern part of Egypt, which was successful, which linked the Red Sea with the Mediterranean Sea so they can get into the Indian Ocean to the east, which was a big shortcut. Nobody's got to go around Africa anymore from Europe uh, and all that. However, uh, Lesseps ran into problems like lack of money to do the project. The climate was horrible. Like they had to cut through jungles. Malaria and other diseases killed a lot of men. Uh, so uh, it failed in the 1880s and they weren't able to do it. Uh, and a lot of people thought that Nicaragua wasn't the best way to put the canal and that it needed to be really where the Isthmus of Panama is. That's where it should go, you know, really. So they're under Secretary of State John Hay. He tried to negotiate with Colombia so they could buy a piece of land where the Isthmus of Canal, where, where the Isthmus of um, Panama is. Uh, it's a typo. And um, let me fix that. Isthmus of Panama. And um, of course, what happened? They ran into a snag um, with, with the Colombians. You know about the Colombians, how they are. <laughs> There's those drug dealers down there. <laughs> and uh, they wanted more money. Um, I hate to use this term or whatever, but uh, I think what um, Roosevelt said famously, he said, those damn Dagos, they want they want more money. They want too much money. <laughs> That's what they call us, like Italians or whatever, uh, sometimes Dagos. But uh, anyway, um, so yeah, the, and, oh, and what the um, I think what they wanted – uh, negotiation-wise uh, with the canal, they wanted a 99-year lease on the land, which was like a 16-mile strip. This is what the U.S. was offering, 99-year lease, 16-mile strip of land. They were going to pay the Colombians $10 million, and then uh, yearly rental to, to, to lease the land every year, $250,000. So it was kind of seemed like a pretty good deal. You know, but the Colombians wanted more. I think it went 20 million or something. They want to double, I think is what it was, instead of 10 million. Uh, and so that really angered Roosevelt, you know. So now he was hoping to like maybe find somewhere else to build it. I think he favored Nicaragua to build it instead. Like maybe they would support the building of it there. Um, but then he realized later that he could maybe just steal the land and just do it. Uh, and so what happened was. There was a revolution that broke out in 1903, often called the Panamanian Revolution, uh, they dubbed it. The Panamanians were kind of mad about this because in that, in that part of Colombia, they, they wanted these negotiations done and build the canal. They thought it would help the economics of that area right there. And uh, so the uh, revolution broke out. And, of course, it happened. So happened that a, a a U.S. ship, a U.S. Navy ship showed up, which is the USS Nashville, <laughs> which I think was planned, I guess. Uh, and the revolution, uh, I think, broke out uh, on the day. If you want the day, it was on November the, um, I think, November 4th, 1903 is when it broke out. So 
Um, so immediately the United States uh, recognized Panama as an independent nation. Uh, and so with Panama being a separate country now, the U.S. decided, hey, we'll negotiate with them the same deal we were going to give the Colombians. So that eventually led to uh, the U.S., of course, negotiating a treaty with Panama to build the canal, which was called the hay bunau Berea Treaty, eventually signed in 1903. What was in the treaty uh, and all that? Well, the same thing I just said about, you know, a few sec, a little while ago, uh, gave, of course, a 99-year lease on a 10, I think it's 10 miles, what it now ended up being, right? Was it 10? Yeah, that was 10 miles, that's so 16 miles. So 10-mile strip of land to build the Panama Canal. Uh, we paid the Panamanians $10 million. Yeah. In my, I guess a dollars, not pesos or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, cash. Uh, and then, of course, I don't know what the money is for Panama. I forget what it is. But um, $250,000, of course, yearly rental agreement, you know, for 99 years, which they would hold it for a long time, of course, and we eventually gave it back to them. And now Panama controls it today, which I think it was – Jimmy Carter gave it back to him, I thought. So I thought people think it was a mistake. But um, but anyway, um, but we ended up actually paying the um, Colombians money back for it, even though we had taken their land and all that. We could have just, you know, taken it. And I guess we we're kind of worried that it might create conflicts, conflicts with Colombia. So the U.S. eventually compensated basically – um, it was actually later when this happened. It was in 1921, <laughs> a few years later, 18 years later, I guess. We gave their money back, I guess, where they thought they should have got. I think it must have been like they wanted 20, 25 million, I think is what they wanted. So we gave them 25 million dollars for that land uh, that we took from them. It's actually a pretty good deal. We're just a 10 mile strip of land, uh, overall. So uh, anyway, I am going to talk more uh, about, of course, you know, the building of the Panama Canal. Um, so yeah, the, the the French, you know, um, at one point had spent millions of dollars on this, and uh, we'll get more into talking about the Panama Canal. Uh, you can see it's a fifty-mile length canal uh, that connects the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and uh, in the next class, which is on Thursday, I'll talk about the building of the canal. We'll get into that. I'll discuss that, how it's constructed. I'll show you a little video clip on it, too, on the building of the Panama Canal, because it's really the peak thing that happened under Teddy Roosevelt. And I'll talk about uh, what happened after Teddy Roosevelt went out of power. We'll get into, we'll talk about the um, William Howard Taft administration. We'll talk about that. And I'll get into um, also Woodrow Wilson's administration. So we're going to get up to like right prior up to like World War One because I know next week I'll move on to uh, talk about uh, World War One uh, and all of that. Um, I do want to mention a few things uh, before I go today. Um, well, one thing I guess I need to talk about. Uh, of course, don't forget about your. Online first exam, of course, you'd see there. Uh, and um, I did move the due date up. So it's been moved up to, like I said, Thursday, October 1st. So, you know, take advantage of that uh, and all of that and get that done. Um, also, Thursday, I am going to have a new Canvas quiz coming up, which it's going to be on the, the rise of progressivism, the progressive era, which was not on this previous exam, if you know about that. Uh, and then I'm also going to have uh, another section two on the quiz on imperialism, U.S. imperialism. So those two will be quizzed eventually uh, starting Thursday. So that's why you need to wrap up uh, your first exam so you can start working on this because a lot of you haven't really looked at the newer lectures I've had lately because uh, I know you're probably concentrating on the old lectures, try to get the first exam done, but try to get that done as soon as possible. I am going to be, you know, sending out reminders till Thursday about the first exam, uh, but try to get that done in quizzes. Okay. So that's it for today.
Um, of course, I will post this uh, video lecture to my YouTube channel. Uh, you know, please send me any comments, questions you might have, of course, about the lecture. Uh, remember, you get bonus points for that. And that's it for today. I was, of course, we'll put up another lecture on Thursday uh, for you to watch later. Uh, and y'all hope y'all have a good week. Uh, what's going on? So y'all take care uh, out there. So see you later.